Welcome to Hope for the Caregiver here on the Family Talk Channel, Sirius 131. I am Peter Rosenberger. This is the nation's number one show for the family caregiver, for those who are putting themselves between a vulnerable loved one and even worse disaster. Somebody who is back and forth to the hospital, back and forth to the doctor's office, staying up late at night doing the laundry, working with special needs children, taking care of an aging parent, has an addict or an alcoholic in their, in their life, traumatic brain injury. There's all kinds of different impairments, and wherever there's a chronic impairment, guess what? There's a caregiver. How do you help the caregiver? What does it look like to help the caregiver? Why should you help the caregiver? There are 39,480 hours of programming every week on Sirius XM. But this is the one hour that is dedicated to the family caregiver. And, you know, I, I'm really glad you're here with us. I'm really glad that, that Family Talk is doing this show because there's 65 million people out there right now serving as a family caregiver. Actually, I think that's a low number. 65 million people who are doing this, and they're doing it without pay. Now, you've heard a lot about the uh, the deficit we have with China every year. Well, guess what? That's $500 billion. That's how much unpaid labor that caregivers are providing every single year. Now, think about that. And they're doing it all the time. I mean, this is, it, nobody's making them do it. They get up and do it for somebody. Now, sometimes, you know, we do it begrudgingly. Sometimes we do it swearing under our breath. Sometimes we do it with tears flowing down our face, but we still do it. And how are you feeling? If this is where you are, you've got an aging parent, or you've got a you know a child with special needs, or you've got a family member or a loved one that, that you are watching suffer and struggle and all these kinds of things, and you're standing between them and a cliff, how are you holding up? That's what the show is for. If you want to be a part of the show, 877 877- 655-6755, 877-655-6755. We are live, and we are thrilled to have you along with us. Speaking along with us, here's the long guy. He's the tall man. He's the man who's never seen a sunset. He's so tall. He is the baron of the board, the sultan of the sound, the earl of engineering, the man who put the word care into carry-on luggage. He is John Butler, the Count of Mighty Disco. Hey, Peter, how you doing today? You know, I'm just precious. It is a spectacular day. We've got a very, very intense show lined up, John. Do we now? Does it involve carry-on luggage? Because <laughs> I'm not checking these bags, man. I'm not paying for that. Uh-uh. <laughs> not checking these bags. <laughs> well, I've, I've got a very special guest on, and I'm going to give her as much time as she wants to take. Uh, I don't Wonderful. do this often, um, but... I'm, I was requested to do this specifically by my wife. <laughs> so, oh, okay. You know, you know, it's my show, so I'm going to do what Gracie wants me to do. Well, because and, 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 you're a wise and good individual, that's <laughs> really. <laughs> no, this is a this is a very important topic that I have struggled with, and and I am not alone in this as a caregiver. And we hear a lot of stuff coming at us, and we don't know where um, solid ground is sometimes. And this is, uh, we're going to talk about palliative care, hospice care, the new um, bill that's up in front of the Senate. You know, when's it right to die? All those kinds of things that are being thrown at us as caregivers uh, as we go into this world. And it's hard to know kind of where solid footing is. And so I've got a very, very, very special guest on who has a lengthy amount of experience on this. And I'm just going to introduce her right now. Her name is Nancy Valco. Now, Nancy has been working as a critical care, hospice, home health, oncology, dialysis, and other specialty nurse for 45 years. And she is now working as a legal nurse consultant. She also cared for her mother, who had Alzheimer's, and uh, who passed away with terminal cancer, as well as her daughter, who also passed away, and she had Down syndrome. Nancy's got some real understanding of the caregiving world um, both professionally and personally. And so I wanted to spend a lot of time with her today and let's talk about these things that are going on, particularly this new bill that's in front of the Senate. So, Nancy, how are you feeling? You with me? I'm just fine. Yes, I'm right here. Um, thank you for being here. 
And let's jump right into this. Can you give me a glossary of some of these terms that we're throwing about here, hospice and palliative and all this stuff? Just just kind of run us through it because some people have been in this world for a while. Some people are just now getting into this world, and we don't necessarily know these things. And I think these are all important things for us to know as caregivers. Uh, I would imagine you would agree with that. Absolutely, and it wasn't until, like I said, I'm not a volunteer in all of this. I'm a draftee, but I graduated from nursing school 50 years ago next month. We're celebrating our 50th year, and I've seen things change. I grew up in the golden age of nursing, as I call it. You know, in medicine, we had Marcus Welby, MD, for those of you who are older like I am. You might remember that in medical center, and there were all these wonderful doctors and I wanted to be a nurse so badly, and uh, I did achieve my dream. And I was uh, found my favorite job, which was in a what is now a level one trauma unit, working with the hardest of the hardest. And we took care of people. You know, it was our ethics were very simple. We did not harm a patient. We would do nothing to hasten dying. Everything was understood. It was not a big deal. But I saw things start to change, and what really got me was when I had my daughter, Karen, in 1982. Now, that was the year that we had the baby doe case, and that was a little boy born with Down syndrome who had a small hole between his um, food pipe and his windpipe that is not an uncommon birth defect and routinely taken care of, and the baby can eat and drink. However, in this case, the parents refused the surgery. They said their obstetrician told them that uh, Down's kids were just nothing more than blobs. And the pediatricians were very upset, and they went to a judge, and like would normally happen, uh, expected the judge to say, yes, you must have the surgery. But this was a watershed case and got national attention. The judge ruled for the parents, saying that they had a right to make any decision or of treatment or non-treatment they wanted to. So the case was being um, taken up the line, appealed to different courts, and lawyers were actually flying to the U.S. Supreme Court in an emergency uh, when the little boy died, and he died of starvation and dehydration at a week old. And we had heard about that. My husband was a doctor, and, of course, I was a nurse, and we had two children. I was expecting a third. And we heard about it. We were just outraged. And we said, well, we'll adopt the baby. The parents refused all offers of adoption. They didn't want their other children to know there was a brother out there. And I was so upset by it. And we said, what happened to ethics? I had been out for a while working with my children and volunteering at church and other places. And I was so upset about it. And someone said, well, what would you do? And I said, well, of course I'd operate. And she said, you don't know and you can't say until you've been there. Well, a couple well, months. Now after, you've been there. Yep. A couple months after Baby Doe, I had my daughter Karen. And she had Down syndrome. And what I was told at first was an inoperable heart defect, and which was a shock. And they said, well, take her home. We think she'll die in two weeks to two months, but you can come back for an appointment in three weeks. And I went home, and this is the days before the Internet, and I got hold of the Down Syndrome Association. I did research. I did all sorts of stuff. And by the time I went back to the doctor, he said, well, she looks pretty good. And I said, well, I've been researching this. And he did some tests, and he says, hey, she's got an 80 to 90% chance with one open heart surgery. It's not as bad as we thought. But then he said, but I'll do whatever you want. I said, excuse me. And he said, well, if you decide not to do surgery. And I let loose. I said, this is discrimination against my daughter. She has to be treated as any other child would with the same heart condition. Her Down syndrome is irrelevant. And if you can't do it, you can't be her doctor. And he did say, oh, no, I'll do everything for her. But that's when I saw, oh, my gosh. And when my daughter was admitted for different tests, I questioned every doctor and nurse that came in, and I found some really bad attitudes. One doctor, since my husband was a doctor, he said, people like you shouldn't be saddled with a child like this. I said, then who should? Uh, One nurse was so bad, I slept under my baby's crib because I just didn't trust her. My trust was gone. Uh, When she was four months old, she had to be admitted to the hospital for um, 
pneumonia, and that's when I found out what choice really means. I was tipped off by somebody at the hospital that I had worked at and who told me that my daughter was made a do not resuscitate against my express wishes and didn't tell me. And I was stunned. I said, why? And they said, because she says you are, quote, too emotionally involved with that retarded baby. And that's what I knew that choice could so easily turn into no choice. Unfortunately, we did lose her despite all care when she was five and a half months old. But the head of cardiology at the Children's Hospital started a Down syndrome clinic, and I got very involved with the Down Syndrome Association, worked with the Reagan administration on baby doe regs, talked all over, uh, trying to get help for these children. We wanted something up there that these children have a right to be treated, any child with a disability. Uh, but I started researching. How in the world do we get to this point? And well, I started researching. And let me let me okay. cut in real quick. For those who just joined, we're talking with Nancy Valco. This is Hope for the Caregiver. And we're talking about some ethics issues that are facing us right now as a society, and it particularly affects us as caregivers. Um, let's let's go. Let's fast forward from the baby doe to governor of Virginia. So we're still dealing with the same subject matter here that's going on behind the scenes. So this is what Nancy's addressing. And by the way, if you want to weigh in on this, the number is 877-655-6755. 877-655-6755. This is hope for the caregiver. So Nancy, uh, I'm sorry to interrupt on that, but every so often I just want to let people know kind of what's going on because we have people joining in and out, that kind of thing. Okay. That's fine, because I started seeing things, and um, my husband, unfortunately, became very ill, and I was supporting the family. And I went back to nursing in the 80s, and I was surprised to find out it was more business-oriented than anything else. And it was quite different. But I also saw how the ethics were changing. And one thing I learned, that the year I graduated from nursing school was the year a lawyer called Lewis Kuttner up in Chicago uh, published an article called Due Process of Euthanasia, the Living Will, a Proposal. And I went, oh, my goodness. So I started looking into it, and when in my state of Missouri they were talking about having a living will, uh, I talked to the people who were going to be pushing it, and I said, you know, this is a problem, and they are actually taking feeding tubes out of brain-injured people in the East, Paul Brophy and Claire Conroy. And they said, oh, well, but this is only for people who are actually dying. I said, it doesn't say that. That's one thing I've learned and why I actually got into legal By the way, nursing. Nancy, let me, let me cut in there. You know, one of the things I've always thought about that particular phrase, we're all dying. None of us is getting out of this thing alive here, and the mortality rate is still at 100%. So... I've always struggled with that. Well, they've only got six months, and so why six months? Why why is it not seven months and three days? You know that kind of thing. Why do they always round it off to numbers that make sense to people, as opposed to factual data? And that's that's always surprised me. This is only for people who are dying. Well, show me somebody who isn't. Well, that's yeah. a, six months is an educated guess. And when I worked in hospice, we would discharge about fifteen percent of our patients because they live longer. And that was, uh, and then we had palliative care, which at the time, and I was doing home health and hospice, uh, we could then keep the patients longer and take care of them, which was great because they still needed home health. Um, and I thought this right. was a great and thing. Uh, and I'm sorry, care. but I keep jumping in on you, Nancy, but I'd like to explain some things because I don't want to assume that everybody's tracking with us. Palliative care, talk about what is that before we go any further. What is that? Well, that's what we thought, and when I worked in oncology and worked in hospice, um, there were palliative treatments, and particularly in oncology, that might be the easiest way to explain it, when it's supposedly to help uh, distressing symptoms, to relieve terrible symptoms, uh, give help to the person and all. But in those days, we didn't have palliative care physicians per se. Instead, if someone had a lot of pain, we'd call in a pain specialist. If they had trouble breathing, or they had a psychological problem, we would call in the experts for that. Um, the palliative care thing really didn't start until later, which is why this has been a problem. Because with the living will, that started, and the six months, which is an educated guess anyway, um, became, well, just terminally ill. 
Now in Oregon, which just which passed the first assisted suicide bill, they've always said we have stringent protections, including there has to be a 15-day waiting period and all that. They've gotten rid of that already, and that's what's happened with all of it. It went from the living will to taking food and water from people with brain injuries, and we saw this here in Missouri. Even though the right to die people, which is what the Euthanasia Society of America eventually became, they said with the living will, oh, no, we're not talking about taking away food and water. And once it passed, they introduced another bill and said don't use the first one, and it would allow um, the family members even to make that decision. Well, let's go back. Are, let me go back to Oregon for a minute. Mm-hmm. So, and, and give me a quick definition of the word palliative care. What does that what does that mean? It's basically, relief of distressing symptoms and taking care of the whole person. Like as in hospice, Dame Cicely Saunders started that. It's caring for the whole person, physically, emotionally, psychologically, um, making death. We never hastened or caused death, but we okay. wanted to make it as uh, the whole process. And these people would be supported in every possible way. Well, and last that was a year, wonderful thing. Well, last year in August, um, a 28-year-old woman shot and killed her special needs child and then turned the gun on herself, but she was unsuccessful at killing herself. And then she was charged with homicide, I believe. How does that reconcile with what you're telling me and all these other things? Why would they charge her if they're, also, if they're allowing it to go on in other areas? Well, What's because it's not a medical person. When assisted suicide was passed and when all of a sudden we had living wills that allowed food and water and everything else to be taken away possibly in the future or any kind of tubes, um, everything changed. If you're not a medical person, then, you know, you go to court. The funny thing is, though, now, and we've seen this here in Missouri, these cases are rarely prosecuted. Here in Missouri, we actually had a nurse who, without a doctor's order, overdosed a patient who wouldn't stop breathing after a stroke when she was taken off a ventilator, and she gave an overdose of morphine and a sedative such as propanifol, which we're used to. Anyway, the woman died, and the uh, nurse felt guilty and did say something to another nurse who reported to administration, who then sent it to uh, the county prosecutor. But the son thought she had done a wonderful thing. It was merciful. You know, his mother probably would never be the same again. So the prosecutor for two years, and I've written about it on my blog, for two years sat on it and then finally decided to offer probation. And the nursing board said, well, you know, she's got this probation and there was no other punishment for it. She lost her job and she was put on probation. Uh, When we don't enforce people killing people, um, we basically allowed it. And I've seen case after case happening like that. A doctor in uh, Holland recently tried to perform euthanasia on a patient who was fighting him. And yeah, saw uh, that. Yeah. And uh, so they charged him. Well, it was only to make it go a little farther because they said, uh, oh, no, that's okay. And they wouldn't convict him of anything. But and a man a man in Montreal earlier this year was sentenced to five years for smothering his wife who had uh, severe symptomatic of Alzheimer's and uh, dementia and so forth, and she was in bad, bad, bad shape. And he reached the end of his rope and he smothered her, and he gets five years in prison. Yeah, it's entirely different. We had a case in Missouri where a family took their mom and was on the parents' 50th wedding anniversary, if, if I remember right, And she had a terminal illness, and they went there, and they gave her an overdose, and she died. And the prosecutor in this little small Missouri town was outraged and wanted to prosecute. But there was so much pushback from the community, he said, I couldn't get a jury to even hear it and had to drop all the charges. We are having de facto legalization. There are some cases where they do uh, come down hard on someone, but all these laws about homicide and whatever, it shouldn't make a difference whether the person is terminally ill or black or white or whatever. You know, you don't kill another human being. But what that's done, uh, since the ethics changed, and like this one nurse put it, she said it changed from do no harm to relieve all suffering. Things started coming in that we hadn't had before. And in fact, uh, a few years ago, I was almost fired 
for refusing to increase a morphine drip on a man who was taken off the ventilator. They didn't quite know what was wrong with him, but they thought his brain was probably fried. There was no reason to think that, but that's what they thought, and I argued about that. Um, And they took him off the ventilator, and he didn't stop breathing. That happens a lot. So the doctor ordered a morphine drip, and the nurse who gave me reports said, he said to increase it until the man stops breathing. We're at 30 milligrams right now. I said, I won't do it. That's euthanasia. And uh, I went up the chain of command. I talked to the doctor who had done the original surgery. He says, I don't want to get involved. I went to supervisors who said, well, that's a normal oncology dose. I said, I spent eight years in oncology. There's no such thing. This is ridiculous. I went up to supervisors, everything, and I turned the morphine off. The nurse who said, the doctor said to increase the morphine until he stops breathing, she said, I covered you. I wrote morphine for comfort, no limit. So I followed the order, turned the morphine off. And at the same time, I had another patient on a ventilator that was waking up. We were taking her off sedation. We were going to wean her off the ventilator the next day after her surgery, who had a lot of pain. And I said, are you having pain? She nodded yes. I said, I'll call your doctor. I said, sir, could I give her like one milligram of morphine IV? She's so uncomfortable. And he said, what are you trying to do, kill her? Both were equally stupid. Anyway, I tried to wake him up, and a respiratory therapist was all unhappy about it, too. They didn't even give him oxygen. They just popped him off the ventilator. And um, I went home, and there was no other nurse to cover for me, but I absolutely refused and let them all know and went up the chain of command. I went home. Two days later, I came back, and he was dead, which I figured would happen because a lot of people were mad about it. And I was called in the office, and they said, the doctor wants you fired. And I said, I did nothing wrong. They said, well, you're a good nurse. How about if we just say we reprimanded you? I said, I will not accept that. They said, how about if we say we educated you on end-of-life issues? I said, I lecture on end-of-life issues. No. And I said, and actually, I followed the order. He was not uncomfortable, so there was no reason for him to have the morphine. And so they said, we'll go and we'll try to figure it out. And some nurses that got around our hospital And this was interesting. I figured I'd be harassed out of a job. And I was a single parent with three children, so it was not an easy decision. And some nurses thought it was euthanasia. Some thought I overreacted. It didn't make that big a difference. But on one floor, the nurses had a similar case, and they came up and they said, you made us think. We're so busy. We hadn't thought about it. doctor ordered an excessive dose of morphine on a respiratory patient, and they knew why. And every nurse went to the doctor and said, hell no, we won't do it. You do it. And he wouldn't do it. So the man had a natural death. Um, it's scary out there. I've well, been, I've, uh, I've, been in, I've been in a lot of situations in the hospital with Gracie through her 80 surgeries that yeah. I can count. And she's been anesthetized more times than I know. My wife lives with extreme suffering. Mm-hmm. And we have. Uh, this is not a situation that we are unaware of. And... We have watched this. We've had lots of conversation with pain management specialists. And so this is why I wanted to tackle this today and get into this. And we're going to come back after the break here at the bottom of the hour. We're going to deal with um, the the new potato bill that's been reintroduced to the Senate. And I want you to talk about this. I want you to talk why this is important. Why do we as caregivers need to know this thing? And I've said for a long time that we caregivers are sometimes all that stand in between our vulnerable loved one and a cliff, an even worse disaster. And sometimes, sadly... That's happening right in our hospitals and right in our hospices and right in all these things. And I've seen too many of these things. Uh, This is Hope for the Caregiver. I'm Peter Rosenberg. If you want to be a part of this conversation, the number is 877-655-6755. That's 877-655-6755. We're talking with Nancy Valco, longtime nurse. Now she's a legal consultant with nursing. This is her passion to talk about and get out, get the word out there. We as caregivers need to be aware, particularly those of us who live with someone who suffers chronically like this. Okay? Hopeforthecaregiver.com, 877-655-6755. We'll be right back. Hey, this is Peter Rosenberger. Have you ever helped somebody walk for the first time? 
I've had that privilege many times through our organization, Standing with Hope. When my wife, Gracie, gave up both of her legs following this horrible wreck that she had as a teenager, and she tried to save them for years, and it, it just wouldn't work out, and finally she relinquished them and thought, wow, this is it. I mean, I don't have any legs anymore. What can God do with that? And then she had this vision for using prosthetic limbs as a means of sharing the gospel, to put legs on her fellow amputees, and that's what we've been doing now since 2005 with Standing With Hope. We work in the West African country of Ghana, and you can be a part of that through supplies, through supporting team members, through supporting the work that we're doing over there. You can designate a limb. There's all kinds of ways that you can be a part of giving the gift that keeps on walking at standingwithhope.com. Would you take a moment to go out to standingwithhope.com and see how you can give and they go walking and leaping and praising God. You can be a part of that at standingwithhope.com. As a caregiver, think about all the legal documents you need. Power of attorney, a will, living wills, and so many more. Then think about such things as disputes about medical bills. What if instead of shelling out hefty fees for a few days of legal help, you paid a monthly membership and got a law firm for life? Well, we're taking legal representation and making some revisions in the form of accessible, affordable, full-service coverage. Finally, you can live life knowing you have a lawyer in your back pocket who, at the same time, isn't emptying it. It's called Legal Shield, and it's practical, affordable, and a must for family caregivers. Visit caregiverlegal.com. That's caregiverlegal.com. Isn't it about time someone started advocating for you? www.caregiverlegal.com www.caregiverlegal.com, an independent associate, caregiverlegal.com. Have you ever struggled to trust God when lousy things happen to you? I'm Gracie Rosenberger, and in 1983, I experienced a horrific car accident leading to 80 surgeries and both legs amputated. I questioned why God allowed something so brutal to happen to me. But over time, my questions changed, and I discovered courage to trust God. That understanding, along with an appreciation for quality prosthetic limbs, led me to establish Standing with Hope. For more than a dozen years, we've been working with the government of Ghana and West Africa, equipping and training local workers to build and maintain quality prosthetic limbs for their own people. On a regular basis, we purchase and ship equipment and supplies. And with the help of inmates in a Tennessee prison, we also recycle parts from donated limbs. All of this is to point others to Christ, the source of my hope and strength. Please visit standingwithhope.com to learn more and participate in lifting others up. That's standingwithhope.com. I'm Gracie, and I am Standing With Hope. How do you feel? Is your body sluggish? How about your mind? What about sleeping? Is that difficult for you? When you had your last physical, what did you learn about your health? Should you lose weight? If you're like so many caregivers, those are hard questions. You didn't get here overnight, and you won't change it overnight. But there are steps you can take starting today. Find more information at a healthierlifeforyou.com. That's a healthierlifeforyou.com. Welcome back to the show for caregivers about caregivers hosted by a caregiver. This is Peter Rosenberg, and this is Hope for the Caregiver. And we are glad that you're with us. You want to be on the show. It's 877-655-6755, 877-655-6755. I want to talk real quick before we get back to Nancy. I need some help. We have a, uh, Gracie and I started Standing with Hope years and years ago. It was part of her outreach to reach her fellow amputees and we do prosthetic limbs for amputees over in West Africa. And it's a, it's extraordinary ministry standing with hope.com. You've heard her ad here and this presenting sponsor of the show, but we collect used prosthetic limbs and they go to a local prison in Tennessee run by core civic. And it's one of their many faith-based programs. The faith-based programs are great because that helps give a better foundation for inmates so that they don't return. Recidivism is not a good thing for them to keep coming back. So we they have found that these faith-based programs really do work. And inmates volunteer to work with us in this, and they disassemble used prosthetic limbs so we can recycle parts from it. Not all of the things can be reused, like the socket. That's molded 
specifically for that particular patient. But the knee, the pylon, the screws, the adapters, the connectors, the feet, the socks, the belts of it, all that kind of stuff can be recycled, and we do. And then we'll purchase new materials and send it all over there. Well, we need some. We're, we're out. We, we've got some special needs right now going on, particularly with above-knee amputees. And maybe you know somebody. Maybe you run a funeral home, and the family member doesn't know what to do with the prosthetic limb of a loved one who passed away. Do not let it collect dust. Send it to us. Go to standingwithhope.com. Standingwithhope.com where it says just donate a used limb. It's right there on the front page. And get involved and help us get the word out of that because those things are like gold to people who are waiting to be able to walk. Okay? It, 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 you got you gotta you gotta look at the pictures of, of what happens, the transformative journey they go on. And let's let's make sure that we can help as many people walk as possible. They go walking and leaping and praising God. And it's 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 an extraordinary ministry. All right, so we are back here with Nancy, 877-655-6755. If you want to be a part of the show, 877-655-6755. We're talking with Nancy Valco. She is a longtime nurse, 45-plus years uh, in all types of nursing care, critical care, hospice, home health, oncology, dialysis, other things. But now she's a a nurse legal consultant here, and she's talking about bioethics and what's going on in our culture. And I think we were all just shocked when Governor Northam of Virginia just let it out of the bag to special needs families, hey, you know, if this child is born with severe whatever, then we'll put the child aside and we'll have a conversation to decide what to do with it. And we were all shocked to hear it so clinically done. I mean, it was just like so matter of fact. And yet, when we keep sending that kind of message, and it's been going on for a long time, when caregivers get to the end of their rope, they're struggling. They don't know what to do. What does... You know, putting mama, mama wouldn't want to suffer kind of thing. And and so we, we, we end up being the decision maker or being the influencer of the decision maker if our headspace is not in a good space. And that's why we're having this conversation here. I live with someone who suffers 80 surgeries, both legs amputated, nonstop pain, all these kind of things. A lot of people along the way thought it'd be a, just be merciful if, if she died. For Gracie, but Gracie wants to live. That's why she just sang that song, Rejoice Evermore. I'm alive, lift up my voice. Gracie is not only alive, she is helping other people walk. And she's got a new record coming out next fall. I mean, I mean, next month. She is, uh, you know, she is very much alive, had two children. Now she's got two grandchildren. And and yet it is contrary to what the world is offering. Next month I'm going to have a young man, well, he's, he's 40 years old now, Named Aaron with Down Syndrome. He was on last year. He makes an appointment to come back every year at Down Syndrome <laughs> Awareness Month in October. Aaron. I'm I'm so oh, glad to hear about he, that. I didn't know that was going to happen. Aaron's coming back. And, nice. I mean, Aaron is an Elvis tribute artist. Oh and, yeah, and <laughs> you know, he, and he's, he is no joke. That uh, yeah, he, absolutely. He is he is deeply into it. So, you know, he's alive. He lifts up his voice, and and Nancy is here today to help give us some understanding. So when we go into these worlds. We need to be prepared. We need to be educated. We need to understand what's going on and what we're going to be hit with when we're dealing with somebody who's chronically suffering. And if our headspace as a caregiver is not in a good space, then what are we offering to our loved one? I'm the loudest voice that Gracie hears most of the time. And she would echo that with a lot of amens, but on multiple levels. John, I don't need any comments from you on that. Um, or or <laughs> snickers or guffaws. <laughs> but, but if my a voice is one... Chortle. <laughs> a chore. If my voice is one of despair or criti- criticizing or, you know, all, doom and gloom and all these kind of stuff, what's it going to do to her? Well, and, your, and what other voices does, does that allow into the space? I mean, because you're, you're in this rather vulnerable condition and you've got all of these ostensible professionals around you and... They might not be in, you know, acting in your best interests. So they, they, it's, it's they may indeed not be. And they said, "Well, just go ahead and, and you know, it, we don't want them to suffer," kind of thing. Gracie's going to suffer for the rest of her life, but that doesn't mean she has a bad life. And she's the first one to tell you. And she's the one that said, "I need for you to talk about this on the air today." Okay, so I'm doing it because I listen to my wife, John. So Nancy, that's I'm just kind of bringing you back to that. <laughs> Sorry about that little detour yeah, there. He's absolutely right. My mother told me years ago, I never want to be a burden on your children. And she never was. But I never tell my children that because they thought I was a burden when they were teenagers and I wasn't even sick. 
we've got to get rid of this idea first. But that's why most people hey, miss. Hey, hey, hey. <laughs> now you, no, but, you're, you're kind of getting close to home now. <laughs> but you know that's true. On um, when they have all the listings of why people do assisted suicide, the, the little records they keep on them in different states, that's one of the biggest things they have is a uh, fear of being a burden on family or caregivers. And with my mother, she always worried about that. Well, she wound up getting uh, Alzheimer's and then terminal cancer. And I was, at, I was asked when she got Alzheimer's, are you going to feed her? And I said, well, yeah. I said, she's not going to die of starvation and dehydration. And right now she gets up and goes to the refrigerator and eats ice cream out of the, you know, out of the basket. Do you want me to tackle her? And they go, no, of course not. I said, no, this is how it is. That's how it was with my daughter because they offered to take everything off my daughter when she was critically ill. I said, she will not die of starvation and dehydration. She will die of her condition. And she was comfortable. And my mother was also comfortable. And we spoon-fed her at the very end. And she had a wonderful, we gave her palliative chemo and radiation to help with the pain because of where it was located in her throat. And she had a beautiful death just the way she wanted. And we took care of the pain. The problem is, is we have the Society for the Right to Die that I talked to you about before has morphed into something called Compassion and Choices, and it's like a business, and they are the ones pushing assisted suicide laws everywhere. I spend a lot of my time going to different states and giving talks on this, but on their website they say, well, you know, if you are in a state that doesn't have it, and this is what we nurses have been seeing, there's other ways you can do it that are legal in any state. One is voluntary stopping of eating and drinking. They even have a, they're working on an advanced directive to stop even spoon feeding if you have Alzheimer's. You can sign a living will for that. They have um, terminal sedation where they go, we'll make you comfortable, and then they over sedate, withhold food, water, and critical medications. I've seen it happen. I've fought this too. Giving pain medicine, but over pain medicine. I do have on my website things to look for when you have a loved one or a friend in the hospital, uh, in the nursing home, which I've had. I know the medicines and all, and I've had too many people call me, and they said, Mom was real perky, and they said, well, we'll just put her in here, maybe start some palliative, hospice care. That's what they're calling this now. And what happened is all of a sudden Mom wasn't that awake anymore, and she didn't want to eat, and they go, well, she must be dying. And it wasn't until later what they realized, and I have tips on my blog for what to look for in that. But now with compassion and choice. Can you, they, can you give us one of those tips just off the top of your head right now? Oh, things like um, most of them have to have like um, care meetings and stuff. Make sure you're in there. Know what the medicines are. Know what the doctors. I ask all the doctors, what's your position on assisted suicide? That's a good bellwether, and you can educate people. But know what they're getting. And I would go in for these care meetings, I would ask constantly, okay, what are the PRNs? Is she getting anything as needed, any pain medicine or whatever? I kept very close watch. Well, I watched now, now, her. Now, Nancy, you throw out a lot of information, but I, even though most of my audience that are caregivers understand these things, what's a PRN? That's an as-needed medication. Okay. And, and so you go into these meetings, and you're, you're very aggressive, and you are very educated, and you understand these things. A lot of people are in this role as caregivers for the first time, and they don't know these things. They don't know what to do. They don't know what to ask sometimes. And we've got to make it simple for them and give them, uh, and hopefully they can borrow a little courage from you. And I, when I first started doing this with Gracie, I just, whatever the doctor said, that was gospel. Because I, did, I, I, I didn't want to question doctors. Uh, I, was, I was brought up to do that. And then I saw... Over that. <laughs> well, I, I got over it, uh, and I remember one time, I had, and I, but the, the first time I did that, I stood up to an orthopedic surgeon. I mean, I was 26 years old. I was just a kid. And 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 then it, it morphed into, you know, I remember telling one doctor, I said, you know, look, and he was giving me all kinds of static, and I said, look, I've been taking care of her since you were in junior high school. Let's get it together here, buddy, and keep this in perspective. It doesn't hurt that I'm a second-degree black belt, but that did, that didn't enter into the equation. The point is so many people are in this, and they don't have that courage to do that. They don't have that wherewithal to do these things. And so I want to make this as simple for them as possible so they have these care meetings. Can they shoo out the caregiver? Can the caregiver be there? How do you make sure the caregiver can be there? Uh, I found when I took care of the woman who founded Doctors for Life, I was her medical power of attorney, 
um, I found out about it. I asked them, and sometimes they kind of forget, and I knew when it was. I said, then we need to have one. I am very aggressive, and even as a nurse, I would take on the doctors sometimes. Uh, when I felt it was absolutely necessary. And this is why I wrote my blog. I've been writing for years. I was a reporter for the National Catholic Register. I've written for women's magazines. I've written secular things. I've written journal papers. But I started my blog, and it's called A Nurse's Perspective on Life, Healthcare, and Ethics. The reason I did it is I wanted to tell people what was going on and what to look for. It's like I have six things you must know about physician-assisted suicide. Because when I travel, I talk to legislators. They haven't read their bills. They don't know that the doctor gets complete immunity and that the death certificate must be falsified for privacy, but it's actually so nobody knows. And it has no coverage, no documentation of what happened except that they got this um, prescription. The doctor doesn't have to be there and usually isn't. If there's a complication, it doesn't isn't reported many times. There's just a lot with it. And legislators go, you're kidding me. We have to understand that legislators sometimes are not lawyers, and they depend on lobbyists to talk to them. And passion and choice no, is very, don't very get me, Don't get me started on what legislators are. Um, but they do. They come back again and again. I've, I've been in Massachusetts and Maryland and recently, and they're coming back again this year to try to get it through. They have even, and there was a bill that was defeated in Delaware, where they put assisted suicide as a palliative care option. This is the problem. All this terminal sedation, stopping of eating and drinking or spoon feeding and extra medicine is called palliative comfort or even routine hospice care for such patients. You have to make sure if you've got somebody in hospice or a nursing home, and I know good hospice. I was actually asked to be the director of a hospice, but I didn't because I saw what happened. It went from Dame Cicely Saunders thing of we never hasten our uh, cause death to the patient's choice. Everything was the patient's choice, autonomy. That's when ethics changed. And I couldn't take it because I saw where it was going and I knew I would be getting into trouble. Let me back up because we got to cover one more thing. But on on that particular issue, the patient's choice, if the patient is in a state of despair Mm -hmm. and they don't have anybody around them saying, speaking life to them, then of course their choice is going to reflect that. And but that this doesn't is... even cover it. That doesn't even cover it. Uh, we had a, I worked on a bill here in, in uh, Missouri. But what happens is, is now hospitals, and many of them do, we found this happened in Missouri, have medical futility guidelines. And some of them are secret. And what happens is sometimes everybody thought when, oh, well, you have a right, you know, the family can make this decision if somebody's unconscious. They found out some patients, some families weren't making, quote, the right decision, so they overruled them. We now have a law in Missouri to make sure that parents of kids with disabilities are notified if they want to put a do not resuscitate or comfort feedings on their baby. We had to fight for five years in the Missouri legislature before we got it passed this year. And the couple that were nice enough not to sue instead said there ought to be a law, um, they were beside themselves. They didn't know why their baby wasn't being treated when he started going bad and found out he was on comfort feedings and he'd been made a do not resuscitate without their knowledge. We're trying to say stop that for everybody. So sometimes, like I found with my daughter Karen, when I said I want everything done, my pediatrician went behind my back and made her a do not resuscitate unnecessarily. This is what's scary. But Compassion and Choices has been pushing, you know, assisted suicide and all of this. And what's scary, you have to understand, I'm spokesperson for the National Association of Pro-Life Nurses. Uh, We're a group of nurses. We strive to seriously care for our disabled, terminally ill, any patient with the compassion and the very highest of ethical standards. And we applaud those medical innovations and supportive care options that can help our patients and family attain the highest quality of life possible. However, um, with this palliative care bill, compassion and choice... Now, wait a minute. Now, this is the one in Missouri, right? No, this is the one in the U.S. Congress right now. Right, now this is the pot- potato bill. Yeah, it's the palliative... All right, now, can you... I need you to. Uh, we only got a few minutes, so I need you to really hammer down on this one exactly what it is that you want us to know about this. What is it called, first off? called the Palliative Care Hospice Education and Training Act. 
and it was brought up, um, supported by Compassion and Choices, who have said that they uh, have a mission statement saying we employ educational training programs and that they wanted, on a, their federal policy agenda, to establish federal payment for palliative care consultations by trained palliative care specialists who will advocate and support the values and choices of the patient. Well, this is why we consider this bill so bad, because what it is is all about training these people and making them uh, good. The problem is... is well, who, who is uh, sponsor, who's sponsoring this bill? Well, they've got several sponsors, and it was done as, oh, we want to make palliative care available to everybody, and we need to train people. However, there is not the need for that. We had one of um, our people went into it, and the it will cost like at least $86 million. Nothing goes to the patients. It's to promote education. It gives federal grants to all these groups that say, oh, we want to have a training program. The problem is this federal funding and what we're afraid of will teach and institutionalize the unethical practices, including assisted suicide, without sufficient oversight, penalties, or safeguards. Um, the first bill, when it came out, it was stopped, um, but then Compassion and Choices backed off when they put a thing in there that federal funding could be removed for objectionable practices furnished for the purpose of causing or assisting a patient's death for any reason, such as assisted suicide. However, that was an old clause that actually said this does not apply to withdrawal of other treatment or feeding tubes. That's not good. And some of the biggest and most influential hospice and palliative care doctors are not good. One of them is Dr. Timothy Quill. He's a board-certified palliative care physician, 2012 president of the American Academy of Hospice and Palliative Medicine, and a promoter of legalizing physician-assisted suicide and terminal sedation. He went to the Supreme Court in 1997. I wrote the nurse's brief on that. I helped to do that, where he was trying to get assisted suicide considered constitutional. He lost 9-0, to zero, but he's not through yet. And he'd be one of the people that could get these grants quite easily. There's no oversight. Who gets it? You know, they apply for... So, so what do we need to do about it? Who'd well, I tell people to contact um, their legislators in Congress, and there are ways to do that. Um, I have that on my... Uh, blog, too, um, because we've joined with others like the Youth and Asian Prevention Coalition and the Healthcare Advocacy and Leadership Organization and other organizations in opposing this. Well, and it's, so we contact our Congress. I'm just wrapping up because we're going to run out of time here. Absolutely. Tell me, tell me in a nutshell, why is this important to the family caregiver? This is important because this is the kind of stuff that they don't know about. And I have seen personally doctors tell family members, your loved one is brain dead. Your loved one will never have a normal life. Your loved one is going to die. That's wrong, and when it wasn't true. And I said, the problem is, by the time I left ICU nursing, I was hearing my some of the people I worked with say, this person needs to die. And I go, they're not even uh, asking for it. And he said, well, I wouldn't want to live like that. But I said, it's very short step from I wouldn't want to live like that to no one should live like that. And right now we don't have enough safeguards for our people. And that's what we're, why we're doing this. We need more programs like supportive programs and good programs. But this is just for training and media outreach and all this other stuff, and it will become institutionalized. And this is just wrong. And like I said, they've even got futility policies that can overrule. Usually an ethics committee in a hospital can overrule the family. I was in on one case where we had a five-year-old who was on a ventilator. She had a lung problem, and eventually it was going to kill her. But uh, and the family kept saying, no, you know, let's get her off the ventilator again. We don't want to just take it off. And she was told at a children's hospital, happened to be a Catholic children's hospital, a new doctor is coming in on Monday, and he will remove it no matter what you say. And they called me and on a Friday night. We couldn't get any lawyers. So I told them, say you want an ethics committee meeting first thing Monday morning and tell them that you're bringing a tape recorder. One thing they're afraid of is lawsuits. 
and that solves the problem. Well, right and that, that brings me to a point here that we as caregivers need to have good legal care to look at all these things. It's too much for us. And we, and I get this, and I have that, but it's very expensive to have good legal care, isn't it? No, it's not. Let me tell you why. Caregiverlegal.com, something I do, $24.95 a month. Caregiverlegal.com, I have full access to an entire law firm through this program. This is, if you are living your life without this, you're, you're asking for trouble because you've got to have a legal care representative in your back pocket so, so that you don't get pickpocketed by all these things and you don't get taken to the cleaners and you don't get all of a sudden down this road and you realize that your wishes are not being uh, met here or your loved one's wishes and you really need to have good legal representation. That's caregiverlegal.com. Check it out. Just just go check and, take a look at it. And we'll also talk to you about people, it. And most people don't know, in July, the Health and Human Services Office of the Inspector General came out with a devastating report on problems in hospice that 80% of them had at least one deficiency, and some of them were very dangerous. Uh, This is the kind of stuff that's important, and this is the kind of information I try to put out on my blog because uh, I call so much stuff from I do research, medical research, I talk all over, and I do a lot of voluntary caregiving, including a 97-year-old woman who, when she broke her hip, and when she was 95, the family was asked, even though she was perfectly conscious, uh, let, do you want us to put her in hospice? And luckily, they were smart enough to know that was wrong. And she's 97 years old and still kicking today. Well, I, I, I appreciate you taking the time on all these things. You've given us a lot of information, and I'm putting it out there for my fellow caregivers. Uh, we have to be alert. The world has changed Um and there and and there's not even a an effort to disguise some of these things now and and I remember the conversation with the Governor of Virginia when he was just on the radio, just like we're having a conversation on the radio right now, and it just was very matter of fact right? we'll just put the kid over there and we'll decide what to do with that kid you know a little later and, and the media does not give you the whole story I'm well the media well don't get me started on the media they they don't give you the whole story on a lot <laughs> of things uh, it's fake news, believe me, they're no good. Um, but now I, 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 I want to talk about this because as caregivers, we have to, I'm sorry, this is our journey. Part of it is we've got to step up and be there to be that second set of eyes, that second set of ears. We've got to protect these people. A lot of people wouldn't want to live like my wife. And yet she has a very incredibly productive life. It's not easy, but this is what we have to do as caregivers is be able to speak life to them. But if we're not giving somebody speaking life to us, how are we going to be able to speak life to our loved ones? And how are we going to be able to be alert and be protective? We're going to put this out on our podcast, Caregiver Podcast, and uh, it'll be free for you to have. Nancy, thank you for joining us. NancyValco.com, B-A-L-K-O, NancyValco.com. This is Peter Rosenberger. This is Hope for the Caregiver, hopeforthecaregiver.com. We'll see you next week.